Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 134. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here each and every week to take your health to the next level. Today, our featured guest is Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's a best selling author and sought after motivational speaker throughout the US and abroad. Sanjeev has written a number of books, including his joint memoir with his brother Deepak Chopra called Brotherhood and The Big Five, which is the subject of today's interview. The Big Five includes coffee, exercise, vitamin D, nuts, and meditation, and we just dig into each of these subjects and how they're going to boost your health. Super interesting stuff. You guys are going to love it. And you guys might notice that the audio today isn't up to our usual standard, and that's because we got Sanjeev to step away from an event that he was at to talk to us in his hotel room. So we were just so grateful to have him speak to us. You guys are going to love this episode. Lots of good stuff. He's very relaxing, very calming to listen to. We're excited to share this with you. Yeah, and like Marnie said, even though the audio quality isn't to our usual standard, you're going to be able to easily make out all the information, and it's definitely worth a listen. You're going to love this. So now a shout out to our show sponsor, Sun Warrior, and perfectly aligned with today's theme, I'm going to announce that Sun Warrior's mocha flavor has made its way to Canada. In the US, you guys have had this for a while. Canadians, you can get your hands on mocha. So why not make yourself a mocha flavored smoothie? So using the Warrior Blend Mocha, adding in some coconut milk, maybe some cinnamon, some turmeric if you want. You can make a little bit more of an elixir. And you can add in a little bit of hot water if you want. I wouldn't add in too much hot water, but if it is cold where you live and you want a warming, smoothie, hot elixir drink, you can do something like that. So get your hands on some mocha, make a delicious smoothie, and enjoy this today. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior products. Super easy to take advantage of this deal. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And for listeners in the US and Canada, bundle that order together, spend $100 or more, and you'll get free shipping. So go take advantage of this amazing deal right now. So now I'm going to give a shout out to Raw Elements, our other show sponsor, and today I'm going to highlight Sawanti organic herbs that they have available on their website. So these are Ayurvedic herbs, so lots of warming, healing, anti-inflammatory herbs such as turmeric, tulsi, ashwagandha. If you haven't experimented with these, I definitely recommend you stock up on some of them. Definitely in the winter season right now, it's a great time to add them into hot beverages or a morning porridge or you can just get creative and add them into different recipes. So you'll definitely want to take a look at these on the Raw Elements website. And again, as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Raw Elements products. Super easy to take advantage. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. And for listeners in the US and Canada, bundle that order together, spend $100 or more and get free shipping. Amazing products. Go and take advantage now. You can thank us later. Okay, so now back to Sanjeev and some of the things we talk about on today's show. We discuss, yes, coffee is, in fact, good for you. We get Sanjeev's opinion on bulletproof coffee. He talks about exercise and how it is the best drug. We go deep on vitamin D supplementation and talk about specific dosages. Sanjeev is a big fan of nuts, and he talks about why they are so good for you. And Sanjeev shares with us his meditation routine. It's uh, very inspiring. You guys are going to definitely get a lot from that. And he talks about also a nightly affirmation that will change your life within a couple of months. And lastly, we get into how you are the master of your destiny and happiness. So we hope you guys love this episode with Sanjeev Chopra. Now we're going to get into things with Sanjeev. Hello, Sanjeev, and welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, and I'm delighted to be uh, on the podcast with you. Oh, we're delighted to have you on the show. Thank you. So what we're going to do, Sanjeev, today is we're going to dig into your book, The Big Five, and a quote on the front of the book from your brother, Deepak Chopra, sums it up so well. The Big Five could very well change your life for the better with very little effort. So what a good summary. These things are relatively easy to implement. And they're going to have such a significant impact on our health. So I'm excited to dig into these. And uh, let's just dig into the first one right away here. And let's talk about coffee. How does coffee positively influence our health? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, my specialty is hepatology, liver disease. And I became very intrigued 
almost a quarter of a century ago when I read an article in Gastroenterology, and it said that coffee drinkers have lower levels of liver enzymes. So when a person goes and sees their primary care once a year, they do a battery of blood tests, and amongst them are these liver enzymes. And if they're elevated, it's in indicative most of the time that there's some liver damage going on. So I was intrigued. Low liver enzymes? Is coffee causing some protection? Is this an artifact? And then studies came out. It said that people who drink regular coffee have less fibrosis or scarring of the liver. If they drink two cups of regular coffee a day, there's a 50% reduction in hospitalization and mortality from chronic liver disease. And then it turns out that primary liver cancer, that is cancer arising in the liver, most often in the setting of any kind of cirrhosis, is the third leading cause of cancer mortality in the world now. And if somebody drinks two cups of coffee a day, multiple studies show that there's a 40% reduction in primary liver cancer. So as a hepatologist, I was intrigued. I started to talk about it, write about it a little bit. And then it turned out that people who drink coffee have a low risk not only of primary liver cancer, but four other common cancers. So four are applicable for men and four for women. So endometrial cancer, colon cancer, skin cancer, liver cancer, and metastatic prostate cancer. It also confers protection against type 2 diabetes. And if somebody has, and there it can be even decaf coffee, but to the tune of about six cups a day, 40%, 50% reduction. And if somebody already has type 2 diabetes and drinks two cups of regular or decaf coffee a day, there's a 30% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, death from cardiovascular disease. Then it protects against Parkinsonism, cognitive decline, dental cavities, gout, suicide, low risk. And then about three years ago, an article appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it said coffee drinkers, men and women, have lower total and cause-specific mortality. And I got about 102 emails that day from around the country and even a few from abroad saying, you've been telling us about coffee and health benefits. We think you're finally vindicated. Article in the most prestigious medical journal. And there are some mechanistic explanations. There's a dose-dependent effect. The dose-dependent effect is best seen in prevention of alcoholic cirrhosis. So we were mystified for decades and decades. How come some people drink a pint of whiskey a day or a liter of wine a day for 20 years in a row? And at the end of 20 years, only about 20%, 25% get cirrhosis. What happened to the other 80%? And we thought it was their genes or the way they metabolize alcohol. And then Art Klatsky, from uh, Kaiser Permanente published a paper, this is about five, six years ago, looking at 123,000 individuals. And if you drink that much alcohol and drink one cup of regular coffee a day, 20% reduction in alcoholic cirrhosis, two cups, 40%, four cups, 80%. Absolutely dazzling. I mean, just mind boggling. It's not a license to drink heavily. And, you know, drink a lot of coffee and then you protect your liver. Yeah, you will, but you can get Korsakoff psychosis and cardiomyopathy and pancreatitis and lose your job and kill people on the road. But it protects the liver. So it's really, really remarkable. Well, Sanjeev, with all these remarkable health benefits of drinking coffee, why do you think there's still so many people that have that negative association with it and... You even have that uh, that general theme in society where people kind of put coffee and cigarettes together and, and label that as a toxic combo. So why do you think this is happening? I think it's a great question, and that's part of the reason I wrote the book. It's not only amongst the lay public, but sadly, even amongst our very esteemed primary care physicians, for whom I have the greatest respect. You know, they have to know a ton of medicine. 
they have to know everything about cancer screening and mammography and uh, enough about diabetes and hepatitis C and gout and asthma and seizures. And so the usual refrain, if anyone listening to the podcast later goes and says to their primary care, you know, I heard this guy and he said that coffee is good for you. If they haven't read all the literature or read the chapter in the book, they will say everything in moderation. These studies come and go. That's the usual refrain by good doctors. Also, it turned out that about 35, 40 years ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was an article, and it suggested that coffee drinkers had a higher risk of pancreatic cancer. And that's one of the deadliest cancers. And it was immediately debunked by about six studies, and it pointed out the flaw in the original study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But a lot of people still remember that. And some of my physician colleagues will say, wasn't there something about pancreatic cancer? And I have to remind them that uh, that study was debunked and that there are dose-dependent effects. Every few months, there's another study talking about coffee and its health benefits. There's also a remarkable thing that just came out about three weeks ago. And this is a study looking at the effect of coffee on telomerase activity. So at the end of my shoelaces, I have a piece of plastic. At the end of our chromosomes, there's something called telomere. And there's an enzyme called telomerase. This was a discovery by Elizabeth Blackburn, an Australian scientist who now lives in California and two other colleagues, and they got the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for this amazing discovery. And it turns out that if you, an individual has shortened telomeres, it means they have accelerated cell aging. And it could relate to as much as 10 years of uh, years lost. Uh, So who has shortened telomeres? Well, it's easy to understand. They are mothers of very disabled children, chronically disabled children, victims of horrific trauma, and caregivers of people with Alzheimer's dementia. The person with dementia is clueless. The person taking care of them, often a family member, is dying a hundred deaths a day, being so sad as to what had happened to this brilliant mind. And who has uh, longer telomeres? It turns out people who exercise, people on the Mediterranean diet, people who meditate regularly, and then the study three weeks ago, people who drink coffee. So we may have an explanation as to why we live longer with coffee. So there is absolutely no doubt. These are studies published in peer-reviewed medical journals, the best medical journals in the world. They're mechanistic explanations. There's a dose-dependent effect. There's something called tumor necrosis factor, TNF-alpha. There's something called C-reactive protein. And it's not good to have high levels of these two. Coffee drinkers have low levels of these two cytokines, these two factors in the blood. So there's something called plasma adiponectin. And low plasma adiponectin is linked with very aggressive liver disease. Coffee drinkers have high levels of plasma adiponectin. And I also like to point out that none of these studies have been sponsored by Starbucks. Well, that's great. And I do want to point out too, though, that we do have to be careful about the dark side of coffee, no pun intended there, that caffeine in the coffee is addictive. And I know this from my own experience that before, say, when I was in school studying, I I would drink a few coffees a day and, and I would feel good. And over time, I built up a tolerance and that became the feeling I had off a few coffees, I needed to have four and then maybe five coffees to get to that point. So let's talk about that, the addictive properties of caffeine and how we need to be careful because a tolerance can build up over time if we're consuming a lot of coffee. Yeah, so good point. And it's not the caffeine that confers the health benefits. So tea doesn't have the benefits. Coca-Cola doesn't have it. It's the other constituents in coffee. There are thousands of them. There's something called caviol. There's something called cafestol. If you take an animal in the lab and produce toxic liver injury, 
Now you repeat the experiment and pre-treat the animal with caviol or cofestrol, it totally abrogates the injury. But you're right, there is a downside to coffee and that can include heartburn. That can include diarrhea in people with irritable bowel syndrome. It can include tremor. It can include insomnia. Uh, so what I recommend is that people drink two cups of regular coffee a day. If they can drink three, that's fine. I personally like coffee. I've been drinking two to four cups for the last 30 years. But I can't drink after four o'clock or five o'clock in the evening. I'll be up till three in the morning. I used to be able to, but as I've grown older, now I'm going to go out tonight for dinner with my wife and another couple. And, you know, I'm not even going to have decaf coffee after dinner. Just don't want to even take the chance. So you're right. One has to balance the potential downside, but the upside is so much greater that uh, it's really remarkable. Okay. And you mentioned tea there a couple of times. Can you talk about tea and is there certain benefits that you get from coffee that are in tea as well? I've only seen one article, one article suggesting that tea may also be beneficial in protecting against liver disease. And, uh, you know, tea, especially green tea and white tea is very rich in antioxidants. So theoretically, that should be good for us, should be good for our health. But it's not proven yet. Coffee is now the number one consumed beverage in the world. About 2.32 billion cups of coffee are consumed every day. Now, I come from India, and in northern India, tea is the popular drink. And I have a lot of relatives in India who drink tea, and they're not happy when I tell them that it's not proven to have health benefits. But here's my take on it I think it's a very wise way of putting it. Uh, I heard this saying many, many decades ago, and it says the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So the fact that we don't have proven health benefits of tea published in good journals doesn't mean it's not true. The research hasn't been done, and it has to be done. And it might turn out that tea is as good or even better than coffee, but right now we don't have that evidence. Well, Sanjeev, in the last number of years in the health world, Bulletproof Coffee has really, really just taken the health world by storm and and people are really loving this and adding it into their morning routine. Is this something you've tried before, putting butter and MCT oil in your coffee? And what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, no, I haven't done it. Uh, Maybe one of these days I'll give it a shot. I was on an interview with CNN London. And the lady asked me to comment on an article that was published in an Australian newspaper. There's a coffee shop in Adelaide where this guy sells a a cup of coffee that contains five grams of caffeine. The typical cup of coffee you and I enjoy has about 65 milligrams. So this is like 12 times the amount. And 13 grams of caffeine is fatal. Uh, he call it, calls it kick-ass coffee. I call it kick the bucket. We have no idea if somebody's taking other medications and they take five grams of caffeine all at once, what it could do to them. So I would be very wary of that kind of caffeine content. And again, caffeine is not shown to be of health benefits. Uh, the bulletproof coffee is very intriguing. You know, I might try it one of these days. I think my daughter in New York has tried it. Okay. Liked it. Well, the one thing about the Bulletproof Coffee, Dave Asprey's biggest thing is the fact that it's been tested for mycotoxins and his coffee is it claimed to be mycotoxin free, which brings yeah. up the topic of quality when it comes to coffee. So what are your thoughts on quality consuming, say, a Starbucks coffee versus going to the health food store and getting like an organic fair trade coffee? That's a great question. We don't have the studies to address that. And uh, all the studies have simply asked, do you drink coffee? Yes or no. If you drink coffee, do you drink regular or decaf? If you drink either of those, how many cups a day do you drink? So no one has really teased out whether one particular brand of coffee is better. That would require a prospective 
randomized study. You'd have to take 100,000 people. It'd be blinded. 50,000, the computer would say you drink Starbucks coffee, the other 50%, this particular brand of organic coffee, follow them for 20 years and then see if there's a difference. So I don't think we'll ever have a study like that. Uh, but right now I say, you know, if you enjoy Dunkin' Donuts, enjoy it. If you like organic coffee, have it. Okay. I think it's safe to assume, though, we're, we're getting that organic certification and we're minimizing pesticides. That's always a good idea. So just That's something for idea. the listeners to keep in mind. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So last question on coffee here, Sanjeev, is what about people that have tried coffee and they really just can't find a love for the taste of coffee? Or they do like the taste and they feel really jittery and they feel off when they have coffee. What do you say to these people? Should they just start out with with like a quarter cup or is there other ways of getting the same health benefits by consuming something else? I know we talked about tea and we don't have any research confirming that that's going to provide the same benefits, but is there something else there? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that is again a great question. And I do have friends as well as patients who cannot drink coffee. Uh, They just don't like the taste. They've tried it before. They try it again. They can't. There are others who try it again, and I tell them, titrate up. Start with half a cup, a quarter cup, and slowly get up to one cup. Let it take four months, six months. At the end of that, see if you can get up to two cups. And there are many of my uh, friends and, and patients who are able to do that. If they're still not able to do it, I say, listen, don't, don't fret about it. We, we can do the other four things that I talk about in my book. And you can live a long, healthy, and happy life. And uh, if you like to drink tea, drink tea. You know, it's rich in antioxidants. It may turn out to be darn good down the road. And and drink it. So let's get into another one of those four. And I want to dive into exercise and talk about what types do you suggest? What are the best ones that you recommend for the average person? Yeah, so exercise is something we all know is beneficial. That lack of exercise and bad eating habits can lead to weight gain and obesity. We are in the midst of an epidemic of obesity in our country. The number one liver disease now is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So under the microscope, it looks just like alcoholic hepatitis, but these are people who are not drinking alcohol and they have obesity and type 2 diabetes. There are 20 cancers linked to obesity. People who have cancer and obese have a worse prognosis. Women with breast cancer who exercise after they've been treated have a lower recurrence of breast cancer. Exercise is really the best drug. What we do, and many of my physician colleagues do, is we turn to a patient who needs to lose weight and whom we want to exercise, And we do something called motivational interviewing. So we say to the patient, on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is it for you to exercise? Talk, a 9, a 10. On a scale of 1 to 10, how difficult is it to exercise? Oh, you know, I tried. After a while, I stopped. And then I tried again. I join a gym every New Year's. Uh, It's so tough. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, could you exercise 20 minutes four or five times a week? What kind of exercise could you do? Well, I could walk. I could swim. Yeah, I could do that. On a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you you could do that? An 8. Okay, what about eating? What could you do to curtail some calories. Doc, you know, I eat two slices of bread with my scrambled eggs and put butter. I could have one. I could have ice cream once a week instead of, you know, three times a week. How confident are you that you can do that? Eight over 10. So what's happened during this entire interchange is I have not once said to the patient what to do. They've said what they can do in order to accomplish the goal of eating better and losing weight. So I say to them at the end of that, on a scale of one to 10, how easy would it 
be for you to lose two pounds a month. Doc, with what I've told you, easy, nine out of ten. Okay, I'll see you in six months, and I expect to see you 12 pounds lighter. And they show up, they're smiling, they've lost 15 pounds. So I think that works. The other thing that works is to give patients a prescription. So once they've said, I can swim five times a week, 30 minutes each day, each time, I take a prescription pad. I put their name, I sign my name, and I say swimming five times a week, you know, for 30 minutes each time you swim, number of refills, infinite. And there are actually studies that show that if you give patients an exercise prescription, it works rather than telling them to exercise. So that's one good way. Uh, we're now learning that you don't have to do vigorous exercise. That's simply start by walking. And, uh, you know, we all know that. You go to these shopping malls in your town in the winter, and there are a number of people walking, going round and round, sitting after a while, go get a cup of coffee, walk. People who like feedback, wearing something like a Fitbit, counting the number of steps, can be very useful. The other very simple technique is to have an exercise buddy with whom you exercise either physically or my exercise buddy. I could be in Boston and I could have an exercise buddy in Chicago or in San Francisco. And using email, I can connect with that person and say, I'm about to go and exercise for 45 minutes. And uh, I'll let you know how many steps I made after I went for this long walk. And that person is doing the same and encouraging you. And you, you could even have a little competition. You know, I did 8,884 steps and the other person says, I did 9,000. So okay, I'm going to try and beat you tomorrow. My brother does that actually with our son. And my brother will sometimes walk purposely to the wrong gate at the airport so you can garner more steps and then connect with his nephew and say, Bharat, I've done another 300 steps. So there's these simple things we can do to exercise. Well, that's great. And I love all the tips you've given. You know, you put the responsibility in your patient's hands and people need to choose what form of exercise best suits them. But as little yeah. as walking, you know, a couple times a week can really add so much benefit, not only for weight loss, but also for cardiovascular health. So what kind of benefits are we Absolutely. getting from re this regular exercise on our hearts? So uh, lower risk of heart attacks, uh, lowers the blood pressure, can lower the cholesterol, can lower inflammatory markers, uh, lower risk of strokes, peripheral vascular disease. So lots of benefits. And I think one of this subconsciously, when you exercise and you've burned some calories, and we know how difficult it is to burn a lot of calories by exercise, I think many people become much more mindful and conscious of what they're going to eat. They say, my God, I, you know, I had to do 50 minutes on the treadmill to burn 400 or 500 calories. I can't have a donut. That's 500 calories. I can negate all this in like one minute by having a donut. So they'll be careful. They'll eat a small piece or they'll eat it once in a while, but not on a regular basis. Uh, so that's that's one of the, I think, other wonderful benefits of exercise. Okay, and we're going to move on to the next one here, which is vitamin D. And there's a little bit of mystery around vitamin D. So Sanjeev, can you get in and explain what do we know right now about vitamin D? So what we know about vitamin D, we call it the sunshine vitamin. It's actually not a vitamin, it's a hormone. It's the only vitamin I recommend people take. Unless they're deficient, you go see your doctor and you turn out to be anemic and it's due to folic acid or B12 or iron, then obviously we need to figure out why and then you take that supplement. Women who are pregnant need to take folic acid. Individuals taking drugs like methotrexate, dilantin need to take folic acid. But otherwise, we don't need to take a vitamin. Vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, the skin converts it to vitamin D1, then the liver to D2, and the kidney to D3. And that's the active ingredient. And what we're learning is that 
that there is actually an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency around the world. We're not getting enough sun. Uh, we're staying indoors. We play computer games. The kids are playing indoors. They're not playing basketball or on the basketball court or getting out in the sun. If we go to the beach or we're playing outdoors, the skin doctors have done an amazingly good job in telling us to put sunblock. There are kids playing soccer in Florida who are turning out to be vitamin D deficient. Many of my dermatology colleagues, professors of dermatology at Harvard Medical School, when they give a prescription for sunblock, also give a prescription for vitamin D3. So it turns out that people, vitamin D is good for muscles, bones, the immune system. People who have high normal levels of vitamin D3 live longer. People who take supplemental vitamin D, if they have underlying multiple sclerosis, have a lower relapse rate. Now, there is going to be a definitive study, and it's going to be, it's being spearheaded at Harvard Medical School at the Brigham and Women's Hospital by Dr. Joanne Mason, and it's going to include 21,000 patients, and they have been randomized into one of three arms, placebo, fish oil, or vitamin D3. I have to talk to her to see what dose of vitamin D3. I hope it's a good dose. And they're going to be followed prospectively to see if there's a difference in health outcomes. But meanwhile, I suggest that everyone get one vitamin D3 level checked once. And if it is deficient, then they need to take 50,000 international units once a week for about three months. That will make their blood level come up to normal. And then they need to be on a maintenance dose. And the maintenance dose is about 2,000 to 4,000 international units a day. If they're sufficient, the blood level, let's say it's 20 to 60 and they're 42, I would still recommend that they take supplemental 2,000 international units a day. There's no risk unless somebody has a condition called sarcoidosis or hyperparathyroidism. So check with your primary care. And let's await the results of this randomized placebo-controlled study that's 21,000 patients, $20 million NIH-funded study. We'll have the definitive answer. So what are your thoughts on getting vitamin D from food sources? Things like fatty fish, such as salmon, beef liver, cheese, egg yolks. Is there enough in these foods to have an impact on our vitamin D levels? You know, the, the answer is no that uh, we don't get enough from fortified milk, from cheese, from salmon. Uh, I was on a trip to Singapore, and uh, there were three other colleagues of mine, two of them tenured professors at Harvard Medical School, the fourth person, an associate professor. And uh, the topic of vitamins came up on the very, very long flight. It's 18 hours, 40 minutes nonstop from JFK to Singapore. And two of my senior colleagues, the chairman of medicine and the chair chief of the hematology oncology division, said, yeah, Sanjay, we take 4,000 international units a day. How much do you take? I said, I take 4,000 as well. And I turned to the cardiologist and he said, nah, I don't take any vitamin D. Uh, he said, I eat cheese and I eat fish every now and then. And, you know, I think I get enough vitamin D. So I, I turned to him and I said, do me a favor. When we come back, in six days, go see your primary care and get a vitamin D level checked. So we go to Singapore, we teach, we come back, and two weeks later, my beeper goes off, and he's on the phone, and he says, Sajiv, guess what my vitamin D3 level was? So I said, 10. He goes, undetectable, zero. So here's a guy who thought he was getting enough vitamin D from foods, brilliant cardiologist, but he's a little dark complexion, and so when he goes out into the sun, he absorbs less vitamin D3. And of course, if he goes to the beach, he puts sunblock. So he got on 50,000 international units every week. After three months, he was sufficient. Now he's taking 4,000 international units a day. It's a very, very common scenario. Wow, interesting story. 
So I really want to get into the next one, which I'm excited to talk about because I love eating nuts and uh, I'm happy to hear that this is one of your big five. So let's talk about why nuts are so good for us. Yeah, so nuts, it turns out, uh, first of all, that all of nuts, so pistachios, almonds, walnuts, cashew nuts, and even the lonely peanut, which is truly not a nut, it's a legume. So there are two recent studies looking just at peanuts and showing that amazing health benefits. People who eat nuts, and I hate to sort of bring this part in, but it's worth noting, who don't exercise and are overweight, but eat a handful of nuts, live longer than people who don't eat nuts. So what I recommend is that, you know, a handful of nuts, and the best time to eat them is before a big meal. So you're going to have lunch at noontime, have a small amount of nuts, 6, 8, 10 nuts, 12 nuts, even 20 nuts, slowly, half an hour, and you'll feel satiated and you'll consume less calories during lunch. One pistachio has only four calories. So if I have 25 of those, break the shell, chew it, take my time, I've consumed 100 calories. That's less than one slice of bread, or one Coca-Cola, or one beer. So it's really amazing. And nuts have been shown to be packed with energy. In ancient times, people revered nuts, eight nuts. I remember growing up in India and my grandfather soaking almonds overnight and then peeling the skin. And every morning when I would visit him during the summer holidays, he'd say, Sanjeev, you've got to have 16 nuts this morning. I don't know how you picked 60, but I ate 16 nuts. And nuts lower LDL cholesterol the bad cholesterol. We have HDL and LDL. HDL is the good cholesterol. Nuts lower LDL cholesterol, lower the risk of heart failure, lower the risk of diabetes. And people who consume nuts, again, a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, even a more recent study about two years ago, have lower total and cause specific mortality. So nuts are good for you. I recommend to my friends, you know, if you play golf, Take a few nuts with you in a Ziploc. If you are have a long commute uh, back and forth from work, keep some in the car. Keep some around the house. You know, don't go for the sweets. One of the things I recommend very, very strongly is total avoidance of artificial sweeteners. So a lot of people I see, they're drinking coffee, they're drinking milk, they have, and then they're putting an artificial sweetener. The body can't distinguish between artificial sweetener and real sugar. And uh, if you have two sweetened beverages a day, and it doesn't matter how you sweeten them, artificial sweeteners or sugar, it doubles the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, doubles it. So nuts are really healthy. Any of the nuts you like, whether it's peanuts, walnuts, as long as there's no nut allergy. Walnuts also contain omega-3 fatty acids, which is the same that's present in fish or fish oil. And if people don't like to eat fish or fish oil, you can have walnuts and get that benefit. I do want to address the nut allergy because it is so common these days that people have some kind of allergy to some variation of nuts. So are seeds... Can that be a replacement for someone who has a nut allergy? Can they have hemp seeds, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and derive some of the same benefits? Yeah, they probably can. They probably can, but uh, not known whether they have the same health benefits. I've not seen a single study. Maybe it's out there, but if so, I've missed it. But I'm not aware of a study. But you're right. The allergies can be huge. That's a whole topic in itself the dirt or hygiene hypothesis, how uh, we're getting many more allergies in developing countries and autoimmune disorders like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, asthma. I have two grandkids, and when they were young and crawling on the floor, I would tell my daughter, let them, let them pick up something and put it in the mouth, as long as they don't swallow it. It's good for them. 
this is the dirt or hygiene hypothesis. So. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. And I also want to address that, you know, our listeners listening to this thinking like, oh, great, this is the free pass to eat more nuts. And I know you mentioned, you know, being cautious of how much because that is the challenge with nuts. They are so right. easy to eat a lot of. And especially if someone's like, okay, well, if I can have it before a meal and then they're not mindful of how much they're eating at their meal, then they can set themselves up for weight gain. So yeah. I know you mentioned just kind of, you know, a handful in, in your palm and being mindful of how much and focus on chewing it to slow down the process and and start to get your stomach acids going so that you can kind of help to curb those cravings. And I also yeah, wanted you to... That is, oh, sorry, go on. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I want to talk about also the quality of the nuts too and making sure that we're choosing nuts that aren't salted or roasted or with added sugars. Are When you're talking about nuts, are you talking about just plain raw nuts in their natural state without anything on them? Yeah, absolutely. I think those are the best. I, you're absolutely right. If you know they're salted, salt can lead to lots of problems. Although it, it's turning out just in, in the last six months to a year that uh, sugar is probably a greater enemy against our health than salt. But have have uh, nuts that are plain. If if you feel like roasting a few peanuts and putting a twist of lemon or some onions with it, which is a common way nuts are consumed in India. People like it, have it that way. But the key, as you mentioned, is be mindful. You know, if you're grabbing a whole bunch of nuts and watching uh, the Chicago Cubs against the Cleveland Indians, next thing you've had you know, 200 nuts, if you're not mindful. It's so easy to not even chew them properly and, and swallow them. And I think the key is to put a, a designated amount, roughly, you know, 15, 20 nuts in a Ziploc bag and don't have that big jar of nuts next to you. Okay, great point, Sanjeev. And we're going to jump into the last topic here of the big five, which is meditation. And I want to start off talking about, because there's so many different types of meditation out there. What type do you recommend and what type do you do yourself? So, you know, they, they all have value. I personally learned transcendental meditation almost 40 years ago. I do it twice a day. I do it early in the morning around 4.30 uh, for about 20 minutes. And then I do it in the evening about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. In the evening, I'm not as regular because work comes in the way, other things come in the way. Uh, going out for dinner comes in the way, but I try to do it twice a day. Uh, transcendental meditation, I think, is one of the easier forms of meditation, but you have to learn it from a trained teacher, the right technique. It's about four days of training, about an hour and a half each day, and then one's on uh, one's own. And when one learns it, one feels happy, creative, fluency in speaking and thinking and writing, your relationships get better. Uh, if you have bad habits, especially if they're excessive, like drinking or smoking, most people either quit drinking or smoking without realizing they're doing it or markedly curtail their intake of alcohol or the amount of cigarettes they smoke. And now the objective scientific data is catching up. So it lowers the blood pressure, it lowers the heart rate, lactate production, causes EEG coherence, concept called neuroplasticity. We were taught growing up that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know what? We can teach. And one of the ways is by meditation. You develop these neuronal connections in the brain. There is areas that relate to compassion. You can light up on functional MRI. And then again, the work by Elizabeth Blackman and others on telomerase, so telomere length and telomerase activity greater in meditators. Much greater in Tibetan monks who meditate many, many hours a day, but people who start meditating and meditate twice a day for 10, 15 minutes a day start to see the changes within four weeks. So I have a way for our listeners to remember these five things and what i say is on a nice sunny day don't put sunblock go for a brisk walk 
to your favorite Java shop. Now you got the benefits of the exercise, the vitamin D3 and the coffee. Don't go nuts remembering this. And before you go, meditate. And there's an ancient saying, you should meditate once a day. And if you don't have time to do that, you should meditate twice a day. Then you really need it. Right? Right. Makes sense. Yeah. So, Sanjeev, one thing about TM, the type of meditation you do, and this is a complaint I've heard from a number of people where it's, again, like you said, there's a number of days involved in, in getting the training done, and there is a pretty substantial cost involved. So is there, yeah. for the absolute beginner listening right now, somebody who wants to give meditation a whirl, is there an easier way that they can just start meditating today without the friction of TM? I mean, maybe that's something they can look into later on down the line type of thing? Yeah, I think there's some online um, and I'm not, I don't think they're as good, but that's a good start. You can't really read about it. Uh, but I think my brother Deepak Chopra and Oprah Winfrey have this 21 day meditation, but it's online. We have, uh, you know, David Lynch in California is a long time meditator and he is raising $1 billion to teach TM to school children. It's being taught in prisons, prisoners who learn meditation, low rate of recidivism. They're more creative. Their relationships improve. Uh, it's really, really, really remarkable. I agree with you. I think the cost should, shouldn't be that high. Uh, and hopefully foundations like the David Lynch Foundation and others will address that, will address the cost, and the cost should come down. When I learned it, it was $200. And uh, if you went as a couple, it was $300. So my wife wanted to learn. And I said, good for you. I don't need it. And she said, we'll save $100 if you come with me. I said, no, we'll waste $100. And she learned it. And I noticed within a month that she had profound changes. And so I went to the TM Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She went for what's called checking to make sure she was doing it the right way. And one month after she'd learned, and I said, I'm not even coming inside. I'm going to sit outside on the street in the car. And the next thing, there was a knock on the door, and there was a young TM teacher who had taught my brother, and he introduced himself, and I sort of turned to him, and I said, tell me about TM. So he sat in the car next to me and gave me the introductory lecture. And I said, listen, I'm concerned about three things. Number one, I'm the associate chief of medicine, and I have to reprimand sometimes these brilliant young doctors from Harvard Medical School, and I don't want to become mellow. He said, Sanjeev, you'll be more assertive from a silent level. I said, number two, I like to have an occasional glass of scotch, and I don't want to give it up. He said, no, you know, whatever happens naturally will happen, then there are no requirements. I said, number three, I'm in the finals of a tennis tournament. And if I learn TM, will I win? He said, I'll be back. So he scurries off. He goes into the TM center. He comes back with a pamphlet. It's called the TM Program in Athletics, Excellence in Action. And it's got testimonials by Willie Stodger, Joe Namath, an Olympic gold medalist, diving champion. And they all talked about how TM helped them perform on the field, how they were focused. So I may be divulging a secret right now, but Tom Brady done TM about a year ago. And look what he's doing. And people were saying, he's gone. He's a goner. And I predicted to my friends, just watch what will happen in the next few months. So it's amazingly beneficial. When I asked him, will I win the finals in the tennis tournament? He said, I don't know if you'll win, but if you lose, you won't feel that bad. I said, hmm, that's a good answer. So I learned. And, and the re regret of most people when they learn something like meditation is, you know, I wished I'd learned it earlier. But there's an ancient saying, it says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So we have to be ready to learn. We have to be ready to change, whether it's exercise, eating healthy foods, thinking positive thoughts. One of the other 
most important thing. So I, I give a talk on called Dharma, Happiness and Living with Purpose. I give it around the country, around the world. I'm writing a book on it. I give it as a keynote to 80 people or 6,000 people. And, and my research on happiness is that one of the most important things is to have good friends. Your friends are your chosen family. A friend is a gift you give to yourself. There's a best-selling author by the name of James Rohn. And he says, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. It's an amazing statement. So if we want to incorporate these good things in our life, we have to choose our friends who are like-minded, who like to exercise, who like to eat the right foods, who like to meditate, uh, who like to travel, who like to discuss ideas. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, small minds discuss people, average minds discuss events, great minds discuss ideas. So there's simple things we can do. Yeah, and just to go over it again for the listeners, the big five is drinking coffee, exercising, eating nuts, including vitamin D in your supplement routine, and meditating. So very easy, inexpensive, and these things have such a big return on investment. So thank you for sharing these, Sanjeev, and and for writing the book. This is fantastic stuff. What we're going to jump into now is a rapid fire question round, Sanjeev. We're coming up on time, but we just want to get to know you a little bit better before we leave, okay? Yeah. So first question is, other than your book or any of your books, what is your favorite health book? My favorite health book? Do you have one in mind? (laughs) We've got so many. Oh, well, we love your book, of course. We love your brother Deepak Chopra's books. I've got a whole collection. So there's there's so many books. There's so many good books. And I think one of the good resources if people want to look up a particular topic is Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic does a fabulous job. The Harvard Health Letter has great information. But if you want to look up any topic in medicine, you can look up, just Google Mayo Clinic and put that topic in there and you'll get some very useful information. For sure. Yeah. And and one of my brother's favorite books for me is uh, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. Oh, I love that book. And that's a book that I, yeah, I I reread it every six months or so. And I say, oh my God, I, I got more out of it this time. Lots of good information. Okay. Next question for you. What's one thing that most people don't know about you? They probably don't know that I'm an avid golfer and that, uh, once in a while, I enjoy a cigar. Confession time, you know. What did Sir Winston Churchill once said, I'm a man of simple tastes, easily satisfied by the best. Okay, Sanjeev, next one. What is your greatest fear? You know something? I, I don't have a fear. I, I live with abundance. I, I teach a workshop called Invitation to Happiness with a dear friend of mine, brilliant guy. Adrian Wilkins, and we taught everyone an affirmation, and I'd like the listeners to know this. You say this every night as you put your head on the pillow, softly in your mind, and just see how your life will change in the next month or two. And the affirmation is, I expand with abundance, success, happiness, and love every day, and inspire others to do the same. That's great. I love that. Beautiful affirmation. That's very beautiful. So if you could go out to lunch with anyone that you are inspired by, could be someone alive or dead, who would it be and where would you go? You know, um, I'd like to go out with lunch with either the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh. Those are people who are alive. Uh, Amongst the people who've passed away, I'd like to go out for lunch with Gandhi. Uh, who led by example. There's this amazing story of this mother who brings her 12-year-old son. And she says, Gandhiji, my son totally adores and worships you, but he's eating a lot of sugar and he's gaining weight. Would you please tell him not to eat sugar? It's not good for him. Gandhi looks at the boy, looks at the mother. They've walked 50 miles from a village. And he says, please come back in two weeks. So they go away and they come back two weeks later. And Gandhi looks at the boy and he says, son, sugar is not good for you. Give it up. And the son says, Gandhiji, absolutely. 
and he starts to leave and the mother comes and she says, Gandhi Jeez, thank you for saying that. But we were here two weeks ago. Could you have said the same thing to my son? And Gandhi whispers into her ear. He says, at that time, I had not given up sugar. Okay. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? You have to lead by example. You got to be there yourself first. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So next one, what lesson has taken you the longest to learn? Oh, that's a good one. I'm still working on it. I, by nature, I'm very impatient. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, and I'm least patient with my own family and my dearest friends, who are my chosen family. Colleagues, people I work with, students, I'm patient. But at home, I expect perfection, and I'm impatient. So if I want something done or I think we should do something, I'd like it done. And it's helped me in my life in an odd way, writing the books. You know, I give myself deadlines and I always exceed the deadlines. I finish way ahead of the deadlines because I'm just impatient. Uh, but that's something I need to work on. Okay. Well, at least you're aware. So our last question what is one thing that the listeners can take away with them after listening to this episode to help them reach ultimate health? I think uh, the ultimate thing, the one thing is that your life is in your hands. You are the master of your destiny. And that if you make a commitment, write it down and write down an action plan next to it. A vision without a plan is a hallucination. So write down your goals, make an action plan, get your best friends, family to support you, and you can achieve anything you want. And the other thing that I'd like people to reflect on is that the same thing with your happiness. It's under your control. And the singular trait of the most happy people on this planet is that they have found their purpose in life. Each one of us has a purpose in life. And it'll come to you by reflecting on it. Or sometimes you witness something horrific and you have the fortitude and grit and compassion to say, this is unacceptable and I'm going to make a difference. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from Mark Twain, who once said, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Beautiful, Sanjeev. What a way to end things. Thank you so much. And for the listeners, we want all the listeners to go and get a copy of your book, The Big Five. There is so much more in there than we're able to discuss on today's show. And where else, Sanjeev, can people go to connect with you and reach out to you after the show? Yeah, so I give a lot of talks. Um, I have an agent and uh, I have a website called sanjeevchopra.com. And so they can go there and they can connect with me. And I try and answer a lot of emails. I, I get a ton of emails a day. I try and answer as many unless it's a very long, convoluted, you know, email. And sometimes I'll say, you know what, let's find a time to connect on the phone and talk about it rather than do it back and forth on email. So I'm happy to hear from people and if they want to share a story. I would love to hear that. Okay, we're going to link everything up in the show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. So listeners, you can head there. There's going to be a nice show summary and links to everything we discussed and to all of Sanjeev's work. So Sanjeev, I know you're having a busy day and we yeah. thank you so much for taking the time to connect with us. This was great. And thank uh, you so much. we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. We hope you guys love this episode with Sanjeev Chopra. So much good stuff. And if you guys are in our group, ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash community, you'll know that I asked a couple of days ago what were five things that could help you to live a longer, happier life. So you guys shared some amazing things, and now you're getting five more from Sanjeev Chopra. So come on over to our group. Join the conversation. We love to engage with you guys week to week. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever you're listening to it. If it's iTunes, super easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash iTunes and we'll see you over in the group. Have a fantastic week. Take care.